Gem International is a new diamond explorer in the richest diamond producing country in Africa, located next to the fourth largest producing diamond mine in the world. International Spotlight is on an 1109 carat diamond recently discovered in Africa by a fellow Canadian junior with a proven operator and finance team. Gem International trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol GI. Visit us at gemdiamondmining.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Sean Broderick. He's a natural resource specialist. His website, King1iBlogspot.com. Welcome back to the show, Sean. Hi, thanks for having me on. Gold seems to keep churning in around the the twelve hundred plus mark, but not really going anywhere. But do you think it will? Yeah, um, it just has some work to do at this level. I mean, it's had a nice little rally. It's one of the best performing things, and and certainly the gold miners and the silver miners have done very well so far this year. And um, so it has some work to do. Its rally was kind of nipped because. Um, President Trump said that he was going to roll out an amazing, tremendous tax cut, and so that meant everybody wanted to buy stocks, and to buy stocks, they sold gold. I think when it rolls out in about two weeks, then some disappointment is likely to actually set in, and so then we could see gold take off again. Um, now, that's not to mean there's anything wrong with tax cuts. I love tax cuts. But the thing is, people will probably anticipate more than they get. Just like a kid looking at all those Christmas presents under the tree, he like builds up so much excitement into them. When he unwraps them, it's okay, but you know, it's maybe not matching as much as his imagination. So that could actually pull things back. One other thing that helped weigh on a gold was a speech by Janet Yellen, um, on, uh, Tuesday when, um, when, uh, she opened the door to more interest rate hikes. People, I should say investors, had been pretty much writing off a March 15th Federal Reserve interest rate hike. And so from what she said, it's not like she said that there was going to be one. In fact, she said she still looked forward to a gradual, to a gradual measured pace of uh, interest rate hikes. But she seemed to leave the door open a little more than people th- thought. And that, along with some... Uh, some uh, higher inflation numbers, that's making people think that, you know what, they might actually mean it. I don't think they uh, do. I don't think the odds of a rate hike in March are that good. I think we're more likely to wait till June. But people can see it coming now, and so that's weighing on gold as well. So you have the two things. You have you have Trump talking about the tax cuts, especially on corporations, so that's kind of jazzed up the market a bit there. And then you have... The same old, same old threat from the Fed to hike interest rates. And so that kind of is really weighing on gold right now. That said, even if the Fed does hike once, it'll still be behind the curve. And their, and their benchmark interest rate will be below the real inflation rate, which is now 2.18%. So, um, you know, I see this as a short-term pullback for gold. That's the way I described it when I was at the Orlando Money Show last Friday and I made a presentation there, was I think this may be a great time to uh, pick out what you want to buy because this may be the last pullback we could have for a while. Once these things play out, whether the Fed hikes rates or not, and once we get a real look at what the tax cuts look like, then we'll probably see gold take off again for all the reasons that we have talked about before. You know, I mean, there are many, many good reasons for gold to go higher. And as long as it's trending higher, and it has been doing that since mid-December, as long as it's trending higher, then um, you want to use those pullbacks just to fix more up. Also, is there a possibility that uh, President Trump could retool the Fed? Well, I don't know. The uh, Fed kind of likes its independence and um, while he has m- made some kind of uh, remarks along those lines, I don't think that's on his main agenda. I mean, he seems to be following up on his main agenda, which is uh, renegotiate NAFTA, build a wall along the Mexican border, 
um, work on other trade deals around the nation and do humongous tax hikes, uh, excuse me, humongous tax cuts. So I think those will probably occupy his time. I mean, overhauling the Fed would be a massive, massive undertaking, and we know that Trump has no patience for details. So who actually would do that? So um, I don't think that's actually on the table, but as we've learned uh, since uh, November, you know, there's always room for surprises. The European Union says it's ready for a battle if he puts a 20% border tax on. They say that violates uh, WTO rules, but Trump has talked about pulling out of the World Trade Organization. He doesn't want anybody adjudicating his decisions. Yeah, this should scare investors. Why it isn't scaring investors, I don't know. There's also the fact that if we stopped sourcing car parts from Mexico, a car in the United States would cost about $10,000 more a piece. So there are some downsides to this, including the fact that the U.S. is a massive energy exporter, you know. And so um, these are some things that have to be weighed against people's hopes. I think really he should focus on the tax cuts and less on the trade treaties. Uh, that would be the easier and probably smarter way to go, though who knows, because, you know, we can't really figure these things out, at least from here. But it would certainly be easier, and he might take the easy path. Then again, there's no way to really tell. What about concerns food costs in the U.S. could skyrocket if they get rid of all the illegal immigrants who work in the farm fields in California? Well, not only that, but the tax, but the trade deals we have in place are really helping American farmers. And I can tell you they're about having cows, um, not just the ones in the field, but I mean just emotionally, because the threat of new trade barriers going up and hurting U.S. food exports really worries the farmers. That is something else. Um, I'm not sure how that's going to work out. We'll have to see what happens. Let's hope cooler heads prevail. Right now, I would intend, I would rather focus on things like um, the global economy seems to be lurching along, actually doing okay. We are seeing improvement here and there. We're seeing China spend a lot more on, like, infrastructure. And on uh, March uh, 9th, by the way, uh, the uh, U.S. infrastructure report card rolls out. Uh, that's only once every few years. And so that's probably, if President Trump wants to pursue an infrastructure build-out, he'll probably use that new report card to do it. He'll say, look, this is how bad things are. This is what we've got to do. So that's good. I mean, certainly we'll have more spending that way, and that could boost all sorts of things. I have made some bets in that area. They haven't really worked out yet, but obviously, for example, cement is going to be in tremendous demand. And uh, so you can look at companies that should do really well. Also, China is um, speaking about clamping down on its steel in industry because the pollution in China, despite all they've tried to do, is just out of control. And the metal industry just really, um, really contributes so much to that. So we might see less steelmaking or at least a slowdown in steelmaking from China going forward. That might help U.S. steelmakers, North American steelmakers as well. One thing that I should point out about NAFTA is that Canada has told Mexico, you're on your own, because Canada seems to be on the right side of Trump, and they don't actually, and he doesn't seem to have any real problems with them. So, um, it's really the Mexican stuff that could be in more trouble than, say, a company in Canada, at least when it comes to actually being affected by uh, hikes in some kind of a new tax at the border or something. So that's something to keep in mind as well. Well, Canada has been working the NAFTA file since the day Trump was elected. They've had lots of people going down to Washington talking to his people. They've been talking to business leaders, and Trump seems to be pretty aware that for 35 states, the majority of their business is with Canada, and if you do anything to hurt Canada, you hurt them, and, and millions of jobs are on the line on both sides of the border. Yeah, I mean, millions of jobs. This is a thing. This is more risk, right? That's what it really is. That's what it comes down to. There's more risk than I think is being priced into the market, and one easy way to alleviate risk is to put more gold in your portfolio. 
I think there could be a bunch of investors that take the easy way out. But we'll see how it goes. It's just, yeah, there's more risk, and every week seems to bring something new. So uh, do you think we'll have more risk going forward or less risk? I think we'll have more risk, which makes gold that, that much more attractive. Well, one of the analysts I talked to last week said his people were pulling investments out of the U.S. because they're worried about it. They're not sure things will work out, especially if they do put a 20% border tax on. Well, I haven't seen that. One thing we have seen, though, and this is quite interesting, is that the um, big foreign buyers of U.S. treasuries seem to turn have turned into sellers. I mean, as an aggregate overall, they're now selling more than they're buying. And that has tremendous implications for the U.S. Treasury market. So what's going to happen there? I don't really know. Will the Fed have to hike rates just to make U.S. Treasuries more attractive because uh, other big countries don't want to buy them as much as they have? That's another risk that has to be priced in the market. That's uh, something to keep your eyes on. And, of course, uh, there's always the possibility of a trade war with China. Does that mean China might actually be investing more in the U.S. to try to hedge its bets We'll work from the inside instead of the outside? There is that. Um, you know, I mean, I am not a China expert. I do know that uh, they really have kind of abused the relationship for quite some time. And so I could see uh, Trump making some headway on that one. Maybe he'll just um, get some, like, deals that he can hold up and, like, point to, and things between the U.S. and China won't trade that won't actually change that much. But, again, it's the thing, and if you open it up, it's a can of worms. Sometimes the right things will wiggle out, and sometimes the wrong things will. So you have to be very careful with this kind of thing. We'll have more with Sean Broderick right after the break. I'm Larry Ray, President and CEO of American Manganese, Inc., listed on the TSX Venture, ticker symbol AMY, A-M-Y, with proprietary patents in the U.S., China, and South Africa. Our focus is on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. China recently legislated the responsibility for recycling onto their electric vehicle manufacturers and importers. For more information, please visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with Sean Broderick. Sean, what do you see happening in the energy market? I just saw an item where Saudi Arabia said it's willing to even reduce its production even more. Yeah, which is really funny because just a couple weeks ago, uh, their energy minister was saying that uh, these cuts could be wrapped up by the end of June. Now they've changed their tune. So um, the cuts have worked so far. And so I can see why they'd want to hang on to it. It certainly helps them out. It's just they have to lead the way. Um, I'd expect oil to hit $60 sometime this year, but that just brings on so much new production from the U.S. oil fields, you know, because suddenly a lot of things that were not working actually do work. Uh, I think one place you can invest is in oil services because we will see more activity across North America as prices are high enough to support drilling and costs are falling fast enough that you can really make some money there. So that's one energy market. The other energy market is, of course, uh, electric power and uh, electric cars, energy storage, stuff like that. The lithium race is on. Prices have not pulled back, even though many analysts were expecting a pullback in the first half of this year. And yes, we're only in February, it can still happen. But we aren't seeing signs of it yet. And the reason is there's still tremendous demand as these new super factories click on one after the other and they want more lithium. And it's not just lithium, it's the other metals that also go in there. Nickel, though actually um, electric power and like energy and like energy storage is a very small part of what nickel is used for uh, it's mainly used for like stainless steel and those kinds of things but still there's more demand there cobalt more demand graphite more demand because of the changing shape of the global energy markets it is just tremendous it's a huge makeover and so you know we will see systems upset by what's going on not immediately I don't think you have to go and sell all your oil stocks. In fact, I'm looking to buy select ones. But this is something you have to keep in mind longer term, is that oil, um, excuse me, 
cars that run on internal combustion will have to stay competitive with electric vehicles. And th that can be a real problem because according to at least one uh, analysis, by 2022, electric vehicles will cost the same as their internal combustion counterparts, except you won't have to fill them up with gasoline. So for people who are making short trips and stuff, that's going to look very, very attractive. And that could reshape the market. And that's not that far away. It's like, you know what, that's only five years from now. And you know the oil companies have to make plans that far in advance. So what is actually going to happen there? I think it could be uh, very interesting, could be extremely exciting, but it could be quite disruptive as well. So we'll have to keep a watch on that. Yes, uh, I mean, that's one of the things that people look at, the, the cost of their daily commute. And if the vehicle is thirty grand, no matter what you buy, then, of course, you're going to look at your daily cost. Right now, you don't recoup the cost of the saving in electricity. Yeah, that's right, yeah. But they say that it's going to change because they are just getting so super efficient at making these cars, making the batteries, doing all that stuff. That's what those huge factories are about is super efficiency. And so when you put that on the table, it, it could be quite exciting. What about rising electricity costs? I know in B.C. they're planning to hike hydro rates by 9% a year. Ontario's already been doing outrageous hikes, and people there are having to have the choice of either heat the house or not eat. Yeah, well, I don't know why those costs are going up. I mean, is the cost of water so much more? Do they have to build new plants or something? Well, um, they're building maybe a they have to build new infrastructure, and that certainly could be it. If you have to build new infrastructure that costs money so that all has to work out that way but um but i'm not really sure why those costs are going up i know that in the u.s at least in certain parts uh the price of like a power that comes from wind from solar is cheaper than it is from coal now so then when you figure in the like social costs of coal that actually becomes quite attractive that way Right. Well, in B.C., they're building a $9 billion dam that there's no evidence at all that they need the extra power, but you have to pay for it. Well, of course. <laughs> if they can get away with building it, they will, won't they? They like the nice, shiny new thing. And uh, then, of course, uh, their jobs look so much more important, so they all need raises. Of course they're going to do that. <laughs> but they haven't developed it. In, in fact, Power consumption in British Columbia goes down every year because we're using more energy-efficient devices. And people are, are really turning off the lights if you don't need them. I know that's what we have, you know, do in our house when we cut our hydro bill in half by doing that. Yeah. It's, I mean, energy efficiency is going to be one of the uh, huge driving forces of this century. Things are just getting so much cheaper. You know, I mean, we've all changed our lights now. We're using a lot less power that way. And um, new uh, electronic uh, devices become incrementally um, more efficient with each generation. When you looked at uh, how much power those old TVs used to suck in, you know, and like what they have now, there's no comparison whatsoever. Those things really are energy efficient. The amount of juice they use is so small compared to what the old things did. And so as we do this transition... We might get to the point, because, frankly, I don't know what more electronic things we need in our lives. We have enough. Um, if anything, I am trying to get my family to put down the tablets and actually talk to each other. You know, that's why we play things like uh, board games and uh, stuff like that. So we're doing more of that interaction. How much more electronic stuff can we use? So, yeah, we could see usage actually go down, unless there's more population growth to drive things up. And we know what Donald Trump thinks about immigration, so we're probably not going to see a lot of that in the U.S. Well, Canada was the only G7 nation that showed any significant population growth. Oh, good. Well, yeah. then you can blame the immigrants for your higher electricity prices. Uh, <laughs> well, one thing that's going to change, too, is LEDs are uh, very efficient, but bioluminescence is coming online, and it's a 100 times more efficient than that. Yeah, yeah. I mean... Fascinating stuff. I haven't found anyone doing that commercially yet, but y you can bet we're 
keeping our eyes on that because that is like one of the next big things coming down the pike. New technology is fascinating. How it can change our lives is absolutely fascinating, and the investment opportunities can be wonderful, but it can also be scary if you've been investing in something because, you know, they'll always need that. Um, I was looking at the at the price of a REIT that invested in New York taxi medallions and what has happened to that recently because everyone Ubers nowadays, right? And uh, when that REIT came out, of course, one reason people thought it was a good investment was because they said, well, everyone will always need taxis. The price of a New York taxi medallion will only go up. Well, a new disruptive technology came along and changed that one, but quick. So, you know, I mean, uh, that's just one of the things you have to keep in mind. They really, one of the only eternal things you have is gold, gold and silver, I guess. But, I mean, when you look what happens to other currencies, um, fiat currencies, with, we might say, alarming regularity, <laughs> then, uh, then, yeah, you might want to have a little gold and silver because, who knows, I can tell you this, I mean... It wasn't that long ago we were teetering on the edge of a financial crash, which the wizards in Washington were able to pull a miraculous cure out of a hat and, like, save us that time. The chance of that happening has not gone down. If anything, they're rolling back regulations. The chance of, of something going seriously wrong in our financial system is going up. And so I don't know how bad that would be. I do not want to go through it, but you know these things happen from time to time. You can just hope there's a quick recovery, but you can also have, you know, something go spectacularly wrong with your currency, and then where will you be? Well, China as well has seen so much money escape through Bitcoin that they're now talking about developing their own cyber currency so they can keep tabs on what people are doing with their money. Right, and that flattened Bitcoin. I mean, it really, at least for a little while, hurt it. And here's the thing. I mean, they actually put um, all these restrictions on how much money Chinese companies could ship overseas to buy other corporations to invest in foreign corporations, which Chinese companies were doing a lot. But the Chinese government said, well, that will slow down the, the like, flood of currency that's, that's, like, fleeing our nation, and so that will control things. But after they did that, It turns out that it's not the big companies that are taking so much out. It's individuals, individuals that want to get their money out of China because money wants to be free. And they are probably so afraid of the Chinese government saying, okay, now you have to give us 10% of what you get because we have this kind of shortfall here. And in a command economy, you can do that kind of thing. So, you know, that's why we had that huge balloon in the uh, housing market on the west coast of Canada, as you guys know and in the U.S., and in Miami, and like stuff like that. And uh, I know that they want to slow things down. I know they are passing new, one might even say, draconian laws to stop that. But at the same time, people will try and find ways to get their money out of a country that doesn't let them do what they want with their money. And so I think that makes the U.S. look attractive that way. It seems like I've just made a good case for the U.S. dollar to get stronger, and I might have. But the U.S. dollar has its own problems, too, and one is the rollback of regulations which stopped financial crises or at least lowered the risk of financial crises happening. Once you do that, you know that the people on Wall Street will just follow greed to its ultimate conclusion, and things, I mean, I'm not saying things will go wrong, but the odds are every once in a while you can have a crisis, and it depends on the mechanisms that have been put in place in how that crisis is handled. And I'm just not filled with confidence with what's been going on on that particular aspect of the U.S. government recently. Well, if they want to go to deregulation, don't forget, Trump just canceled the Obama law that forbade, forbade them from dumping coal waste into rivers. So now, Well, it's yeah, but um, which is a... Bad thing if you live in a state where they actually do that. But I'm thinking more of, like, the fiduciary rule, which they just got rid of. Um, and, uh, you know, so now pretty much they don't have to tell you if they're um, how much they are profiting from what kind of investments they're actually selling you. And there are good reasons to put that in place. I've seen a parade of people on TV saying, oh, it's a good thing to 
get that out of the way. It'll unleash the forces of, like, American capitalism. No, it won't. It'll just make people afraid to invest because they don't know if they're going to get ripped off when they do. I think that was a terrible idea. I, I mean, President Trump is doing some things I like, but his team is doing some things I don't like. It's a mixed bag, as it always is with Trump. Well, I guess it depends if they get permission from the Russians or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a whole other uh, can of worms, and we'll see how that plays out. I mean, uh, certainly uh, certainly, we haven't seen the end of uh, that particular snake, so we'll see that one keep clawing up and uh, see who it bites. But uh, that is very interesting as well. Sean, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks very much for having me on. My guest has been Sean Broderick. He's a natural resource specialist. His website, king1iblogspot.com. That's king, the number one, the letter I, blogspot.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Questions for the show can be sent to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.